Today we're going to talk about the fugue and your textbook has a good diagram here of how a fugue goes, but fugues are complicated pieces of music and they have vocabulary to learn and no two fugues are the same. So this diagram and the description is only a general thing, which without context uh, doesn't give you very much mastery over the subject. So let's talk about what a fugue is. A fugue is a piece of music that became um, beloved by composers uh, during the Baroque period. And it's also a form or a, a way of writing a piece of music. And your book on page 140, which is just off camera down here says, uh, fugues are built around one main theme, which help gives the work a strong sense of unity. And the theme is featured alone at the beginning and then repeated often during the work. That is true. So there's a main theme that you'll hear at the very beginning of a fugue. And the best way to understand a fugue is to learn that theme very well. Now your textbook features Bach's Toccata and Fugue in D minor. And um, now a few editions ago, this was not the, the fugue in the book. And I think they changed it because um, amongst other things, the Toccata and Fugue in D minor is a really, really well-known piece of music. Uh, and I'm not gonna play it here, but go and uh, make sure that you include this in your listening so that you're familiar with it. It's problematic though, in terms of teaching a few. It's very famous. You'll recognize it and go, yes, I've heard it. It's been used in movies and, and all kinds of things. But um, and it's problematic as a few teaching device because first off, there's a toccata at the beginning, which is uh, a bunch of sort of noodling around by the, the organist. It's written out in this case, but it's sort of a, a improvisatorial fantasy on you know, some, some ideas that they're playing. And so that goes on for a long time. We're not at the fugue yet. And so when you get to your listening, um, uh, active listening and recording um, section in MindTap online at Cengage Learning, um, you know, you, you can listen through it, but you kind of want to skip past it to get to the fugue. Oh, just got an email, sorry. The next thing that makes it problematic is that the fugue subject goes by really quickly and the notes are fast and it's hard to sing back. And so it's hard to learn the subject of this fugue. Interestingly, fugue subjects or main themes, I should have, should have mentioned that before when we say subjects, we mean main themes, um, tend to be really long or really short. Um, it's like the composer either wants to spin out a really beautiful, lovely theme for you to hear and then build a world around it, or they wanna get that that main theme out of the way as quickly as possible and get into the crafting of the fugue. So again, uh, if we were trying to listen to this together and you should go and do that, um, you'll find it frustrating because the theme goes by in a matter of about a second and it's got alternating notes. And you can see they're showing you this here in the diagram. Well, it's this note and that note, that note and that note and that note and that note. And this takes all of about a half a second to a second to play. And there's these other notes that are countered to that all the time. And it's great. And there's nothing wrong with it. It's a masterful fugue, but it's hard to learn. So today, what we're going to do is we're going to use the fugue that they had in the textbook uh, a few editions ago. It's called the Little Fugue in G Minor. And if you did your listening to the instrumentation, that's the one that had the pipe organ. And I'm going to go back to that. And you should, um, for review and practice, go back to that as well. It's on the um, schedule. Um, back about two days or so. And uh, it's, let's see, um, for fall 2020, when we're doing this in Zoom, that would be on the October 16th page. Although this is film is used for different classes, you'll have to adjust for that. Okay, so before we get started there, let me explain uh, some things about the fugue that you'll wanna know. Uh, the first thing is, that we have special vocabulary and they have this diagram here. And so vocabulary number one is that your theme or extended melody is called a subject, okay? Sort of like the topic of the fugue, okay? And then later when you have like a second theme or secondary theme, we count that and call that as the counter 
subject or the second subject that's playing off against there. And then after that, we have material that's neither a theme nor a counter theme. It's like other material, okay? Uh, and it's like, I'm gonna call it filler in a way. Its job is to be there, but it doesn't have, uh, doesn't have enough stuff to call it a new theme or counter counter subject or something like that. And this is called free, and sometimes it's called free material, but free contrapuntal material. Um, contrapuntal means uh, polyphonic or, or stuff. Think of it like um, uh, shortstop in baseball. They're there, they need to be there. They fill an important role, getting that gap between those bases, but they don't have a base of their own, okay? So what's gonna happen in, in a fugue is you're gonna hear the main theme right off the bat. We call it a subject. It's gonna play all on its own. And then, as you can see in this diagram, what happens is, and these voices here, uh, we should put this in here. Voice just means line of music, right? Remember that the Renaissance was all about vocal music and this is, you know, the next, the next period of time grows out of that. So when we think of lines of music, um, we think of them as voice parts. You know, voice one would sing this, voice two would sing that, and so on. So in the themes uh, here that we have, we have voice one all alone, or the first voice that comes in, the first line of music that comes in, plays the theme or the subject. Now, when it gets done that, another voice or line of music comes in and starts on the subject as well. It repeats this usually at a different pitch level. So it's not exactly like a canon or a round, uh, but it is imitating it and you'll hear it. And then what happens is the original line or voice of music that did this alone first will progress to the second theme or counter subject. And the theme and the counter subject will interlock. They mesh perfectly their, their, their polyphony with each other. And so they will interact and play at the same time. And then a third line will come in and start on the subject and go down this. And by the time the first voice or the first line has done this and then this, it moves on to what we call free material. It's still there. It's still fulfilling the role of being that first voice or first line. So we get a one, two, and then three line texture, right? Um, but it moves on to what we call free material. It, it sort of fills in the gaps and does what it needs to do to help articulate the chords and keep it sounding like there's material going on there, right? And then it can happen that a fourth line will come in. Now, here's where, hmm, it gets tricky. This diagram is misleading. For instance, sometimes fugues only have three lines, okay? Not four, right? And we call that a three voice fugue or three line fugue, right? And sometimes they have four, but sometimes they have five, right? So it could be more than that. Typical fugues have three to five lines and they follow this pattern. First line or voice comes in and goes subject, counter subject, theme, counter theme, and then sticks around doing free material, stays relevant. And then each next voice or line comes in after that. Now it's confusing because it's all played on the same instrument many times, often the pipe organ actually, because they had multiple sets of keys as two hands and two feet as well. But they, you know, fugues can be orchestrated out for any kinds of instruments or voices, like actual vocal parts, okay? The next thing is, this makes it seem like the highest line comes in first and then the next lowest line and the next lowest line and so-and-so. And in fact, um, there are different configurations where, um, you know, the first line could be in the middle and then the next line could be higher and the next line could be lower and so on. Uh, they can do this though, highest to lowest, and that's what we're gonna hear in our recording, okay? This whole introduction of the themes or the subjects and the counterplay between them all is called the exposition section. Now, we've, we've gotten to the point where pieces of music are so complicated that they actually have dedicated sections that do things. In the exposition of a story, you're introduced to characters, settings, and plot uh, points and things like that to get the narrative started. That's the same in music. Right, we're introduced to the themes, uh, all the characters that would be playing and their interactions and things, um, and uh, you know even the key or the the scale that we're using or are in. Although 
generally, like these things, uh, they stay in, in two keys. They use two keys back and forth um, so that they can put these at different like uh, pitch levels. So it's not just repetition, okay? But it's pretty, pretty harmonically stable. It stays in one or two keys right there. And the exposition is over once the last voice gets in and does its subject or theme. And then boom, we're done, okay? Um, let's listen a little bit. And, and here's what you want to do with, um, here's the important thing to do, I think, with these, uh, these themes and, and such. The important thing is to first be able to recognize the subject, okay? So in this case, the subject has, is so long and it's very singable that it's got a beginning part and an ending part. And you hear it alone at the beginning. So let's just listen through. Now, if you're really interested in learning how to hear fugues, you sing along with this, you get to know it. You, you, it becomes a melody that you can always identify when it comes in. And this one's very distinct. So here's a little fugue in G, the subject at the very beginning of the exposition. Okay, that's it right there. Um, I'm going to let you hear that again. Uh, and um, let, me, let me see if I can help you a little bit there too. The beginning of this theme or subject goes bum, 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 bum. We call that the head or the first half of the subject because with these long subjects it's broken into parts. And then the tail or the second half of the theme or subject is Bum 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 ba ba bum 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 ba ba bum ba ba bum ba 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 bum, right? So it's a very long theme, and it has two parts: head and tail. Now I'm going to let this time play the the subject out this first time, right? And I'll point out the head and the tail, and then when it gets done, you're going to hear another line of the organ come in, and it's going to do the subject over. Okay, it'll be. Uh, a little bit lower, okay? And then what you'll hear in addition to that, uh, more notes, is the original voice has moved on to the counter subject, okay? And the counter subject is like, and, and these are the things we wanna hear. We wanna hear and remember the subjects because in the middle later, when we get to this part, uh, it gets all complicated with other material and hearing these subjects and counter subjects or main themes and secondary themes come out are sort of like our anchor points or, or life, life bowies that we catch on to in the otherwise very confusing sea of, of uh, the notes and things. Okay, here we go. That's the head of the subject and here's the tail now. And we're right here. And I get ready. Second voice. Bum, 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 bum. And now we're going to move on. And a third voice will come in in just a second. And wait. Here. Bum, 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 bum. Get ready for the bass one. Okay, we're done. That was the exposition. Now. I'm messing up the recording of this for you because I'm singing the, the theme because your job here is to remember the theme, the main theme, the subject. If you can hear that when it comes in, bum, like bum, bum, ba, ba, da, 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 then even if you get lost, you'll see that and go like, oh, there it is again. Kind of like if you got lost, I don't know, looking for directions of things, but then you 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 see a, a landmark again that you go like, oh, that's where we are, okay? And, you know, truly the free material parts here get buried as the texture gets more and more complex, but that's part of the joy of the fugue. And you're just like, how does that all work? Well, it, it works because of music theory and compositional genius, but 
There you go. Now you might have noticed in this particular fugue, the subject came in and then the next subject came in in voice two, and there was like extra material between here and here. Um, it has to do with uh, making the keys work. Remember how I said that fugues sometimes start out in one key and then these move in different keys. It's true that in this particular case, we're in one scale right here, and then we've moved on to another scale right here. And this one wants to come back to the original key or scale that we're in. And he had to write a little transitional music to get back there. That can happen. Mechanical must haves, or uh, in order to get this to connect to something else, we have to have some duct tape can occur. So that's very normal, okay? All right, we're gonna play again uh, from the beginning and see if you can hear when bum 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 comes in, because then you know that each of the voices is coming and you're keeping track. Once this is done, that we're done the exposition and then we'll talk about development. All right, here we go. There we go. Voice one, subject one. Get ready. Voice two, subject. And there'll be some transitional material. So the timing will seem a little delayed. And get ready. Voice three. And finally the bass. Fourth voice. Okay, and we're done. Once it finishes, that yan dun 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 yan da da dun dun yan da da dun da da dun da 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 exposition or first section of the fugue is done. Okay, and hopefully you could hear that, and I hope you're excited. If you've never done this kind of listening before, and it was all just like, wow, it's a lot of cool sounding notes and things. Now you're starting to hear technically what's going on. You learn the subject. Yum, bum, bum. Ba da 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 dum dun 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 da da dun 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 da 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 and then you can hear the entrances and you can hear when they complete. All right. So what happens next? The development. The development is the composer's playground. Um. Here's what happens. Basically, the development is the composer taking um, alternating, okay, new material and restatements of the subjects and counter subjects and some of the free material, but there's a trick to it, okay? So new material and that, and they're alternating. So we've got, we've got subjects and counter subjects versus new material, okay? It's a little more scripted than that because developing, one of the things that we define developing is, is taking pre-existing material, in this case, these themes here, and putting them into new keys. There are other ways to develop material, which is to cut them up and to do, um, and reassemble them in different ways and explore you know, different ways of setting them or resetting them and things like that. And we'll get into that more as a device in the classical era. And it happens in Baroque music as well, but let's keep it pretty simple right now. One of the main ways that we do development of music is we take pre-existing material, the theme or the subject, the counter subject, okay? And we restate them again, restate them in new keys. That means we've modulated or changed our tonal center. Um, it's like, uh, and, it, and, uh, and, and you're using different scales, okay? And this is not something that's easily perceived without a lot of training, or if you're, you know, if you have like perfect, perfect pitch, I guess you could pick that out. Um, but that doesn't mean you, you still can't um, psychologically and just aesthetically enjoy the effect of it. Like think about film. Uh, if you're a filmmaker, you have, 
Um, you're thinking about angles of shots. You're thinking about timing. You're thinking about cutting from one angle to the other. You're thinking about all kinds of things that like non-filmmakers don't even think about, like color palettes, um, uh, that kind of you know, like like tons of visual technical things that communicate a story. And we as general movie and 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 video consumers are affected by those things, but but that doesn't mean you have to actually be conscious of them going on to enjoy it. Um, yeah, so um, that's that's an important thing to understand. Now, the more we know about that, the more we can appreciate what the film director is doing with their work. Um, and and like an example uh, of that in a really, really like on the nose. If you've ever gone back and watched the old M. Night Shyamalan movie, um, uh, the Sixth Sense, and I'm going to spoil this for you because it's an old movie. Um, the color red is very important. It's not there except at specific things, right? And so it, now it has a psychological effect on you watching the film, even if you don't know that, uh, because it's a distinct color and you're not aware, aware that it's not available most of the time and then it happens, but you know, it, it does affect us similarly. Composers going around to different keys and restating this material has a psychological and aesthetic effect on us. And it makes it so that it seems new and yet still familiar because it's old material. It's very important. And if we were in a music theory class, we were analyzing these pieces and getting really deep into them, we would find that the other scales or keys, tonal centers that they move to and do have um, patterns or families. Uh, that they, they do. It's not just random. It's kind of like if your original key or tonal center is here, there are places around the map that, like if you think of this as a physical map, that they like to visit. Not way out here, but it will go like to here next and then there and then there and then there and then there and then there. And it doesn't have to go to all of them, but there are specific areas that it likes to go to. So there's technique buried in there, it's not random. And um, the technique is based on the fact that, um, that these different places or keys, tonal centers that they restate the themes in um, have important similarities or relationships with each other. So anyhow, there's that. So we're gonna hear restatements of the theme, which you're good at now, because we've heard it a bunch of times and you've been practicing it and I've been singing it to you. And then we have new material. And mostly the new material is uh, what we're gonna call sequences. The alternating material is a sequence. Now a sequence is when you take an idea and you restate, it's a small idea, and you restate it again and again and again at different pitch levels, usually stepping down or stepping up, okay? Um, right at the very beginning of this development, we have one of those. It happens immediately, it goes, it goes bum, 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 bum. These are notes, dun, 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 dun. And then it steps down and goes, dun, 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 dun. You'll hear this, right? Dun, 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 dun. Here's my idea. And it happens again at a note, you know, step down and a step down. And so this is a, a device that they love to use because it's taking a fragment and restating it again in different ways. Um, over and over but you know down or up a step or something like that this is what we call a sequence it's when you take an idea a gesture and you repeat it again and again usually stepping down or stepping up okay two or three or four or five of these okay um but why why do we do that well this sequence has a job and the job is to change keys so they work hand in hand. In the development section, the composer will like to do two things. Will like to restate the subject and the counter subject in new keys, okay? So at different pitch levels. And then alternating between that, they will do new material, which is fun for them to work out. And then that material will rise or fall, right? A step or two at a time, which takes us to a new key so that we can do this again. And they're symbiotic in that way, right? Now, um, every composer will build different sequences and build materials 
um, differently. And of course, their subjects are different. And if we get into the nitty gritty, almost always in the Baroque period, most of the time, really good composers will build their new material somehow out of portions or pieces of their subject and counter subjects. So when you hear the theme at the very beginning, it's like saying, here I am, I'm a great melody and I'm gonna combine with other things really well. And you're gonna dissect me and cut me into pieces and create new material out of me as well. So people like Bach who are masters of this kind of music um, would literally design their entire fugue out of the first two measures of the music, which was a single line, okay? So in this development section, we're gonna hear sequences, little repeated ideas that go up and down by steps, and then restatements of the subject and counter subject, okay? And what happens is it builds and builds and builds and builds and sometimes crests energetically and then pump comes back and things, but it's changing key and alternating new material that gets us to a new key and then restatements of the original themes in those new keys. Um, and then eventually it will come back around eventually. And it's, it's not set, composers get to choose when this happens to the original or home key where we started. And then it will restate that again, okay? One last time, all right. So I'm gonna walk you through the development. It's gonna start with a sequence um, which is new material, and it goes bum ba da dum bum ba da dum bum ba da dum bum ba da dum. It's this little idea that keeps going again and again, and then eventually you're going to hear the subject come back in, and then it will go away as new material is explored in sequence and things, and then the subject will come back in, and this is a great game of sort of saying I'm lost and I'm loving it, and then it's okay because I'll hear the subject again and again and again. Eventually. It will come back around to the home key, the original scale and key that we were in, G minor in this case, restate these subjects one last time, and then we're done, okay? All right, so I'm gonna back up, I think probably to the bass voice entrance of here, around there, and I'll walk us through this, so let's see. All right, here we come, development. Bum, 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 bum. Right? And subject. Bum, 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 bum. And as soon as this is done, we move off into new material. And that's a little sequence. Bum, 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 bum. New subject again. And we're in a different key. And new sequence coming up. And wait for it. Subject again. And this sequence has come back again. And still, and the subject just came back. And a new sequence. Subject. And uh, I think we're in the home key. Maybe not. Yep, there we are. That was the home key. And we finished. All right. Now, um, 
hopefully that's exciting for you to start getting a glimpse of saying, I understand, I can hear that if I know the subject really well and I listen, right, then I can hear it come back. The goal of listening to a fugue is not actually to know technically everything that's going on. The goal of the fugue, however, is enhanced the more that you do. Uh, the goal of the fugue is to listen to it and enjoy it as peace. And part of that is to understand a little bit about what's going on. Um, some people say, for instance, um, oh, I love listening to this foreign language. It's so beautiful. Uh, I went to Japan and lived there for two years and worked as a missionary for my, my church when I was a, a young man. And, you know, people would tell me, oh, the Japanese language is so beautiful. And it, it is. It's, it's, it's got different sounds than, than English. And it's beautiful in its own sort of sound. But if you're sitting there listening to people talk for more than about two or three minutes and you can't understand anything that's going on, you'll get tired and your attention will, will fall away. You might even start to fall asleep. And, and listening to you know music is similar. If there's not something for you concrete that you understand to go on there, then after a few minutes, uh, your attention will start to wander unless something amazing from just a... Uh, the sound point of view pops up and grabs your attention. And that, that's another device we can talk about later. But um, so when you listen to a fugue, you don't have to know every key that we're in. And you don't have to know where every sequence new material is derived from, from the original subject and things like that. But you should know what the subject is, right? So that you can identify it and recognize it. And so those are anchor points. You go like, there it is, there it is. Now we've come back around and this is home. And that gives you enough that there's structure for you to hold on to and not get lost or, or, or uh, sort of you know, fade away on, but then you enjoy the complexity of the interactions of the sounds. You enjoy the, the sheer sort of uh, hubristic, or it's not hubristic, hedonistic, sorry, uh, feeling of, of all these tones and rhythms and things going together. You enjoy the power of this case, the, the wide range and variety of sounds of the pipe organ and the virtuosity of the piece um, that all happens and and is enhanced because you can now map it out you don't have to have a name for everything but it's nice if it's familiar territory right it's kind of like if you go for a long drive after a while it's just cornfields and soybean fields if you're in the midwest and it doesn't mean anything to you whereas if you lived in the area and knew it then you could recognize unique uh, landmarks and things that would, would give you a sense of timing and such. All right, so what do we do from here? You should review this video again and listen to the little fugue in G minor and see if you can hear the entrances of the subjects, right? And know when we get into the development, right? You should listen through the development section and listen and say, oh, I heard a subject, oh, I heard a subject, oh, I heard a subject, and enjoy the material between. Occasionally, if you hear the same material again, repeated and repeated, these little ideas, recognize that that's a sequence. His job is to give us a break from the subject and help us get to the new key for the next restatement, okay? Finally, you're going to hear it come in really, really low and powerful, um, and he's restating for us that we're in the home key, and we're going to just do this one last time when we've come back around and finish. And then you give yourself a pat on the back and say, wow, I'm listening to a complex, complex piece of music and I'm making sense of it. And hopefully you learn to enjoy it uh, because you know it's there for our aesthetic pleasure in a way, uh, first and foremost. Okay, uh, what do you do with the Takata and Fugue? Well, now go and listen to the, the listening guide. It's really long, it's two pages long. Understand that the first two minutes or so is just stuff going on. It's called a Takata, right? The, you know, and then you have the fugue that happens and don't get even frustrated if it's hard to hear the subject of the fugue. I already told you it's fast and it's out of the way. And then at the end, after the fugue is done, there's even this sort of thing that goes on as an epilogue called the recitativo, right? Which is fine. Uh, this is a famous piece of music that you will always be rewarded with having familiarity with. And of course, it will be on your listening tests as well. Um, what do we do with this information, which is now all smudged up? Let me finish with a recap of the things that are important, and then you can go away and sort of uh, ponder those last third times through the quizzes of things that we're doing. Let me get back to this right here. So what is a fugue? 
a fugue is a piece of music and a form. Um, the music and it's a form because the form is exposition and development and the exposition has a formula inside of it which is that diagram right there okay so that's the answer a fugue is a piece of music that was popular in the baroque period and popular afterwards as well that is both just in itself a fugue but also a form or formula that has a beginning section called the exposition which has the entrance of the voices coming in one at a time and the development section there okay and then what do we need to know about that? Well, we need to know that um, there's some vocabulary. So like voice equals line of music, right? And you can have three, three, four, five voice fugues. Three to five is most typical. Um, and and uh, theme is called a, the main theme is called the subject, right? And then the, Secondary theme is called the counter subject, right? Oh, can't write sideways. Sorry, I'm trying not to get my hand in the way of, of the camera there. And then we have, um, we just like, um, then we have, I'm gonna call it stuff. That's so technical and academic, but it's called free material, right? Free material, after you've done a voice has done the subject and the counter subject. It stays around doing stuff. Okay. And you should look at that table and memorize that, you know, voices come in one at a time like that and they combine. Remember that it doesn't have to go from highest to lowest. It can bump around. It doesn't have to be four voices. It can be three, right? Or, or five, but, but it has that thing. And when the exposition is done is when the last voice, okay, last subject is finished right? And then we go to the development, okay? And the development is basically the subject and the counter subject in new keys, right? New areas, harmonically new scales, alternating with new material, and that material is usually sequences. And sequences are when you take an idea and you repeat it again, usually up or down several times, going up or down by steps. Bum ba da dum, bum ba da dum, bum ba da dum. And they do several of those in there. And these will go around back and forth and indeterminate a number of times. But then finally, the last time we return to original, sometimes we call it the home key. So the original scale or key, sometimes we call that the home key. And we state the subject and the counter subject one more time. And then we finish the piece, okay?